So our next speaker is Dr. David Jones from the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias, and he's going to talk to us on common envelope evolution from binary star chrysalis to cosmic butterfly. Believe Away you go. Thank you. So while I get set up, I'd like to say a, a big thank you to the, to the society for letting me give this talk, and even more so for letting us have our discussion meeting here today, which I don't know about all of the other, uh, other attendees, but I would say was a great success. OK, I will be talking about the topic of the discussion meeting that we had earlier today, which is the common envelope, <clears throat> and how that relates to the formation of these objects, planetary nebulae, which are often called cosmic butterflies. So before we, we get into what is the common envelope, we have to return to Stellar Evolution 101 and have a quick whistle-stop tour there. And so the important thing that we need to, to bear in mind is that as a, a typical star, a sun-like star, exhausts the hydrogen which it burns in its core, uh, it moves off of the main sequence and starts burning hydrogen and later helium in shells around the core and increases massively in radius, increasing by a factor of 100, maybe even 1,000 in radius before eventually losing its outer layers in the form of a slow but very dense stellar wind right at its very end of its life, exposing the core, which is now a pre-white dwarf. It's a degenerate object which then shrinks and warms up before joining the white dwarf cooling tract and just slowly <coughs> cooling for the rest of its life. In the meantime, it's hot enough to ionize those outer layers which had previously blown off in the stellar wind and those are the, the ionized outer layers are what we see as the planetary nebula. So the kind of picture that we have is that the star keeps increasing in radius and radius until eventually it blows off its outer layers, exposing the core, which gets very, very hot, and ionizes all of that material into a planetary nebula. And so this classical picture we have of a planetary nebula, this is Abel 39, sort of an archetype of a single star planetary nebula, where we have this ejected envelope, which was lost as part of a slow, dense wind while on the asymptotic giant branch, which is then ionized by the remnant, which was previously the core of the star, is now evolving towards being a white dwarf. So that all sounds very good, but returning to the radius evolution that we mentioned before, where stars, like the sun, can increase in radius by a factor of 100 or maybe even 1,000, that makes us wonder how White dwarfs, which we know are the products of these stars which previously occupied such a large radius, can have a companion, another star, much closer than that distance. So a companion star which would have previously been inside the radius that it occupied while on the asymptotic giant branch. And this is one of the most extreme examples taken from a press release from earlier this year, the discovery of, in fact, two white dwarfs, so two stars which have gone through this huge expansion, which orbit each other in just a few minutes. So their separation is even less than the solar radius. So extremely close. So the question becomes, how can we form systems of evolved stars, which are much closer together than their previous radii would have been? So that problem uh, made Bogdan Brzezinski in the mid-1970s and collaborators come up with this idea of the common envelope. And that's most easily described by making ourselves a little toy binary star with two main sequence stars here. The more massive one on the right is slightly bigger and the less massive one on the left. And we draw a, the dashed line around it, which displays what are known as the Roche lobe of this system, which is the smallest surface of gravitational equipotential that includes, includes both stars. Basically, that means that any material which is inside this half, this lobe, is gravitationally bound to this star. Anything that's inside there is gravitationally bound to this star. And anything that's outside will either be bound to the system as a whole or unbound completely. OK, so bearing in mind what we mentioned before about the stellar radius evolution of a star, how fast a star evolves depends on its mass. So in this hypothetical binary that we've created, the first star to evolve off the main sequence and start to increase in radius is the more massive star. And if the two stars are close enough, it might reach a radius which is 
comparable to this Roche lobe radius. So the largest radius it can maintain while still having all of its outer layers bound to it. But if its radius evolution demands that it goes even larger than that, it will begin to transfer material to its companion through this point, which is known as the first Lagrange point. Now, if that mass loss, or the mass transfer rather, is sufficiently fast, then this star won't be able to thermally adjust to it and will also increase in size. And so, so long as this star keeps trying to increase in radius, the extra material has to go somewhere else and it goes on to form a common envelope of material surrounding both stars. So essentially, we have the companion star and then the core of this more massive star orbiting around each other inside a big cloud of gas which is not co-rotating with the system. So it's kind of like swimming around in treacle. So these stars experience significant drag forces in there and transfer energy through this drag force into the envelope, unbinding it and expelling it. But at the same time, this energy has to come from somewhere, so it comes from the orbit, and so they shrink. The orbit between the two stars sh shrinks, so they move towards each other, so they transfer energy and um, uh, angular momentum into the envelope, meaning that it's unbound, preferentially in this plane. In order to conserve angular momentum, if we want to shrink the orbit of the binary, we have to throw something out, and that is this envelope. So, now I'll show you a quick hydrodynamic model of this process. So, <clears throat> this is a model from Jean-Claude Passy of uh, 2012. This, uh, these different colors show density. So this is the most dense, this would be the core of the very high, very massive star, of the more massive star, which is expanded. And right now you can't see the companion, but as soon as I set the, the simulation running, you'll be able to see that the companion has been placed directly on the edge of this envelope. And so that's an important thing that I want you to remember because I'm gonna tell you later on that that's wrong. <laughs> right? but, so they begin the simulation with this star right on the edge of the envelope. And you can see it slowly begins to transfer material onto the companion while spiraling in slightly and throwing out material in all directions in the orbital plane. So this is essentially if we're looking down on top of the binary orbit. And so we're moving these two cores closer and closer together, all the while expelling the previous uh, envelope material into the orbital plane in a sort of uh, spiral or disc-like structure. <clears throat> and, so we're reaching. and one of the uh, other important things that I'd like you to bear in mind here is that the, while it looks as though the companion star is gaining mass, in these simulations it doesn't because there is a huge entropy barrier between the surface of that star and the envelope material. So in fact, these simulations predict that the companion star should say more or less exactly the same, and the only thing that should happen is that all of this envelope would be ejected. And now as we reach the, the end of this video of the simulation, you can see that the initial separation that was this big is now much less. So we've shrunk the binary orbit. In fact, this simulation doesn't go far enough. The binary orbit itself would probably shrink by a factor of 10 more. So you can get extremely short orbits by this process. <clears throat> and so, given I gave you this idea of, the classical idea of how planetary nebulae form, where at the end of their lives, sun-like stars lose their outer layers in a slow, dense wind, which is more or less isotropic, and then get swept up by another wind from the now emerging white dwarf. With that model, we find it very difficult to form these kind of structures in planetary nebulae, which maybe you can't see so well, but here we have a sort of hourglass-like structure, which just using an isotropic wind is very difficult to form. This, which seems to have a sort of spiral structure, or even here we have two shells. And as a final fantastic example, which maybe you can't see so well, this uh, is a fantastic nebula called Fleming 1, where we have a, like an equatorial disk. Thank you, <laughs> Gary. Uh, and then a fan, uh, an amazing pair of rotating and episodic jets. So these jets process, spitting out bullets every so often, and so you can see that they sort of carve out arcs along the sky. And so now, with this uh, binary scenario, this common envelope scenario where we're ejecting much more material in the orbital plane because we have to conserve angular momentum, we have a natural way of producing 
axisymmetric structures. Because if we dump all of that material into the orbital plane, when the white dwarf is now exposed and blows its much faster but much more tenuous wind, it's going to be free to expand in the polar directions, but it's going to be restricted by all of that material in the equatorial plane, so you'll end up naturally with a more hourglass-like structure. <clears throat> so that's great. That means that we can use these planetary nebulae to study this ejection process, this common envelope, which is, uh, we'll mention later on, is very key for a number of different phenomena. And as the planetary nebula itself is the ejected envelope, these are the few objects that we can really use to probe this process and how these stars uh, begin to form such close binaries. So the question becomes, how do we detect the binary stars in these planetary nebulae? Because some planetary nebulae will come from single stars, because, just as I showed you in the beginning, the original picture is that a normal single star will lose mass on the AGB and former planetary nebula. And the outcome is remarkably similar to this common envelope evolution, other than maybe the morphology of the resulting nebula. So we have to know which ones are binaries and which ones are not. So how can we find the binary central stars? Well, the product of the common envelope is a white dwarf with a lower mass or with a main sequence companion. So a star which has not yet exhausted all of the hydrogen in its core, which was initially the lower mass star onto which all of the mass ended up being transferred. And so we can find those. If we're very lucky, the inclination of the binary might be such that we can see eclipses. So we might see one star pass in front of the other, and that's very easy to detect. But in most cases, we're not that lucky because, in fact, the stars are rather small. So the chances of having that sufficiently high inclination that we will see eclipses is rather low. So in most cases, we detect them through what is known as irradiation. So this is a little toy sketch of one of these binaries at different orbital phases. So you can see that this uh, white dwarf, which is the, the previous core of the AGB star and is now the thing that is ionizing the planetary nebula, is very hot. It's maybe 100,000 Kelvin with a companion star which is only a few thousand Kelvin in a very short orbit. So that means that all of this ionizing radiation also hits the near side or the day side of the companion star. And so depending as we go around the orbit, we will see a different projection of this day side face, of this irradiated face, and we will see a different amount of flux. So here we're seeing mainly the back, mainly the night side, so we would see less flux from the system. Here we see half and half, so we see a little bit more, and then here we're seeing most of the irradiated side, most of the day side. So as this binary star goes around its orbit, its integrated flux forms a sine curve. So here we're looking mainly at the night side of the companion, here we're looking mainly at the day side of the companion, and so we have this sinusoidal orbital variability. And in fact, this is a binary star that we discovered in this nebula, known as the Necklace Nebula, because of its necklace structure there. But there's a problem, because this irradiation effect, as it's known, is a very strong function of the parameters of the system. You can imagine that the further apart these two stars are, the less of the high energy ionizing radiation from the, from the hot white dwarf reaches the surface of the companion star, and thus the lower the effect, the lower the difference in brightness between the day side and the night side. And in fact, we see that fairly clearly because the separation between the two stars is also a function of orbital period. So beyond a couple of days, we start to lose all of the systems that we're looking for. They might show some irradiation effect, but it's on a very low level. The same with inclination. If you can imagine that same system, but placed entirely in the plane of this board, we would always see half of the day side and half of the night side, and there would be no change at all. So again, anything which has a very low inclination, we'll also lose. And then interestingly, because these stars are so hot, the primary, the white dwarf in the system is so hot, the main uh, contributing factor is, as to whether we can detect a, a different companion star, a different mass of companion star, is actually not its own temperature, because even for all types of main sequence star, the difference in temperature will be huge. It actually becomes more a function of the size of that star 
and more massive main sequence stars are bigger, so they intercept more of this radiation and we have a larger effect. So in fact, lower mass stars will also begin to lose because they're much smaller. <coughs> okay, so with that in mind, once we found these stars, what can we use them to tell us about the common envelope phase? How can we constrain those hydrodynamic models that I showed you earlier? Well, the key thing would be to find all of the parameters of everything. We can start with the binary stars themselves. If we obtain light curves, so these are multiple images of this uh, particular binary, which is in the center of this planetary nebula. We obtain multiple images and measure how its brightness evolves as a function of time. We can and combine that with measurements of its radial velocity as it goes around the binary orbit. We can produce models which constrain all of the parameters of the binary, the masses of both stars, the temperatures of both stars, the radii of both stars, and the inclinations of both stars. And also, I want to include this picture just to show what a difficult job we have, because these beautiful nebulae can be a real pain when you're trying to measure the brightness of your star. So in your standard astronomical filters, B, V, R, and I, you can see that you almost cannot see the, the star because it's sur completely surrounded by this very bright nebula. So in fact, if you want to do very precise photometry of these stars, you want to measure their brightness very precisely, you have extreme difficulty doing it in standard bands. And for this star, for example, we did it in a very narrow continuum band of H beta. But anyway, with those kind of observations and models, you can derive all of the parameters, including the inclination. And as I've already said, one of the key predictions of this common envelope model is that all of the material from the common envelope will be ejected into the orbital plane, and then this will go on to form the waste of the bipolar nebula. So if we can combine the inclinations of the, if we can compare the inclinations of the binaries to the inclinations of the nebulae, we have our first check that our picture of the evolution is real. <coughs> and so how do we determine the inclination of the nebulae themselves? It's very difficult because we only have one line of sight. And so you have degeneracy. If I show you this picture, you might say to me that that is a round nebula. It looks pretty round. And it goes against all of our ideas of what a common envelope should do, because this is a post-common envelope binary. It has a period of two days. You could not have had a AGB star in that size. But in fact, it is an hourglass, but seen almost end on. So this is the image of the nebula. This is what we would see if we were in a privileged viewing angle, looking at it from the side of the orbital plane. And these are that same model inclined at 10 and 15 degrees. And so the real inclination is somewhere between the two. So how can we do that? How can we uh, derive that, in, that uh, structure? Well, we have the two dimensions in the plane of the sky just from taking an image. What we need is to recover that third dimension. And that third dimension we can recover using kinematical observations. So because these objects emit in single emission lines, if we can observe those emission lines with enough resolution, we can begin to see velocity structure in those lines. And those, that velocity structure is then what probes the third dimension. So you take, for example, in this nebula, we took a long slit spectrograph with very high resolution, and you place your slits over multiple places in the, in the nebula. And then for each slit, you end up with a diagram where you have uh, distance along the slit in one direction, and then the velocity, which becomes a probe of that third dimension in the other axis. And you can build a model of the star, and you I mean you can also see that directly these slits here and here, which are the slits which go through the center of this nebula, they already begin to give you a little idea of the structure straight away because they look like a cross section. Thank you. So, Using that, we can derive the inclinations, and if you look at the inclinations of the nebulae against the inclinations of the binaries, they match in a perfect one-to-one -one relationship, which tells us exactly what we expect is happening. What else? So I also told you that the models of the binaries give us the temperatures, the masses, and the radii, and if you look at the radii compared to the masses, and compare those to normal isolated field stars, so isolated stars of the same mass, you find that they're always apart from one case, which I'm going to show you in a minute, uh, 
they're always heavily inflated. Compared to normal stars of the same mass, they might be two or three times bigger. And so we take that as being evidence that before the common envelope occurs, there is mass dumped onto the companion star. So the one exception to that rule is this object, which we discovered earlier this year, uh, which, in fact, cannot be inflated because it's already as big as it possibly can, can be without transferring material back to its partner. And in fact, because of that, we think that when the pre-white dwarf evolves to be a white dwarf by shrinking a little bit, it won't be too long before the companion star in this system actually begins to transfer material and evolves to be a cataclysmic variable and perhaps even produce a nova, which wouldn't be the first example that we've seen inside a planetary nebula. This one was discovered in 2007 as a nova going off inside a, an old planetary nebula. So what other evidence of this mass transfer that I've told you must happen before the common envelope? In this system, which I've already shown you once as the beautiful sinusoidal light curve, we find that the low mass red dwarf companion in this system is heavily enriched in carbon. And low mass main sequence stars shouldn't have much carbon. They should be much richer in oxygen. So in fact, this uh, carbon has all come from the primary star as it evolved along the AGB. It became <laughs> carbon rich instead of oxygen rich and then transferred a lot of material onto the star all before going through the common envelope. So what other evidence do we have that this phase of mass transfer happens before the common envelope rather than during or after? Well, if we go back to this system which I showed you earlier with these beautiful jets, the hydrodynamic models of the formation of these jets, based on the precession period that we can observe, say that the binary that which launched these jets should have an orbital period of around 100 years or maybe 1,000 years. But when we go and look at the central star, it has a period of one day. So this means that the mass transfer episode which formed these jets happened before the common envelope phase and before the binary shrunk down to its current period. So the pre-common envelope period was around 100 days where it launched these jets. Then we experienced a common envelope, shrink the binary, and it's now one day. Okay. And indeed, if you look at the kinematical ages of these jets, so how long it would have taken them to get where they are, you see that in a number of systems, they are all older than the central regions of the nebulae, which we think are the ejected envelopes. So this again tells us that this mass transfer which formed the jets was before the common envelope. Okay, so how long do I have left? Two, Two minutes, okay, so I'll try and go quickly. <clears throat> so with all this in mind, one of the main things that we've been trying to do is uh, increase the number of binary central stars that we know in order to get statistics and study this stuff in more detail. So. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing is taking these photometric measurements of these stars, looking how they vary, see if they vary in, in, in brightness, but focusing on nebulae which we think must be formed by this common envelope, such as this one which has this bipolar structure which we think is a hallmark of the common envelope. So, yeah, so we went... Uh, Miguel and I went and took some photometry of this system, and immediately we see that it has this nice variability on a period of 2.1 hours. But I already told you that the, the typical variability from this irradiation is sinusoidal, and my sinusoidal fit is not very good. That's a big deviation there. So we were puzzled as to what that could be, but luckily we were observing with someone much cleverer than either of us, <laughs> and Biff the cat <laughs> knew that in fact that meant that the period was twice what we thought it was, and we were looking at a different type of variability. Instead of irradiation, we had two stars which were filling their Roche lobes, and rather than having uh, variability due to irradiation, instead we have variability due to the differing projections of these two stars. So you can see when you look at them side on, they're sort of teardrop shape and bigger, so brighter, and then when you see them from the, from the poles, you just have less, less flux. And so, our models of this system indicated that both stars were evolved stars, both stars were white dwarfs, and that their total mass was greater than the Chandrasekhar mass, which some of you may know is the maximum theoretical mass for a white dwarf before it will explode as a supernova. And given the proximity of these two stars, we could calculate that in around 700 million years the two stars would merge making a single star greater than the Chandrasekhar mass and thus explode as a supernova. So that means you get a nice press release with this beautiful video that they made for us 
of the two stars merging and exploding. But unfortunately, that's not the end of the story because uh, we shared our data with another team, rather stupidly, and the other team did a, <laughs> did a more detailed analysis than we did, and they discovered that depending on the lines you use to measure the radio velocities, which are the key things when it comes to measuring the masses, you could get different, uh, different velocities and thus different masses. And they decided that that must be because of interstellar uh, contamination, which actually means the masses are probably less than the Chandrasekhar mass. It will still merge, but won't be a supernova. But it's still interesting because some of the best candidates that we have for these super Chandrasekhar mergers are found inside planetary nebulae. And indeed, we know that a number of supernova type 1a are found to explode in environments consistent with planetary nebulae. So these kind of systems with two white dwarfs that might merge should be very rare, but in fact, we see lots of them, which is extremely interesting when it comes to noting that the Supernova 1A were key in the award of the uh, 2011 Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize for the Accelerating Universe because these are used as standard candles to measure cosmological distances, but we still don't really understand exactly how they are, uh, why they explode or what their origins are. And so these might well be the key objects in constraining their origins and finally understanding why supernova type 1a are such good standard candles. So I'll stop there and you can read my conclusions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That was an excellent talk. Uh, open for questions. Yes, please, Garth. It's me again. <laughs> there seem to be three models for type 1a supernova, that is the single degenerate, double degenerate, and the sub-degenerate, because they, there's one paper where they say that if there was still hydrogen content contamination of a very low percentage, nevertheless, it would actually reduce the Shangri-Sha mass at which it would actually tick go supernova. So the yes. question is, if you're going to use them as standard candles, are they standard candles at cosmological ranges rather because we establish those standard candles at sort of local ranges then extend that to cosmological? <coughs> and I just kind of think, well, if these three types forming a mix, if they somehow uh, <coughs> evolve secularly over cosmological time, then we could actually be misleading ourselves as far as dark energy and so forth are concerned. I absolutely agree, which is one of the main reasons why I think <coughs> This is very interesting work in that kind of context because it's, it's really important if we want to say that they really are valid standard candles on cosmological distances, we really should understand their origins. And if, they all, if there are multiple competing pathways which all contribute, uh, are they still standard enough? Okay, thank you, David, again. Thank you. We move on. Thank you very much indeed.